Those are the screams of a 17-year-old girl, a troubled youngster crying for help. They're asking you, how does it feel? This is called confrontation therapy. It comes in various forms. It is supposed to help troubled children. And you're running your lives and standing up there, trying to make people feel sorry for you, and putting your gaze on a child, and you better start answering questions and being honest. Because with you, it's going to be one minute more. Give me one more minute, just a second, maybe tomorrow. It's now, Elaine. It starts now. No, you know you never tested yourself. I did it when you I was there last never, time. I ever. did it when I was there last time. Yeah, well, for a couple days, you've never tested That's it. That's all the long You've never tested it. it. There's your father right there turned around and told you he's going to take control of it. And that's what, exactly what you want, but then you won't look at him over. A few years ago, these teenagers might have been put away in juvenile prisons or traditional psychiatric wards. Today, they are the raw material of a growing industry, an industry that treats troubled kids. That word troubled is a relatively new label for kids like these. It used to be that we had bad kids who were locked away in reform schools and sick kids who were locked away in mental hospitals. But in the past decade, we've been seeking an alternative. Instead of simply punishing unacceptable behavior, we've been looking for ways to change that behavior. This facility called Elan claims to be able to do that. Elan is a leader in an expanding coast-to-coast -coast industry, parts of which we'll look at tonight. The growth of that industry has been spurred by the availability of government money to pay for an alternative treatment. But there is another, more basic reason. This country is producing millions of youngsters who are in trouble with society, with school, with their families, with themselves. NBC News is grateful to the parents and children who are included in this report. They agreed to participate in order to help others understand this national problem. The children in this report are not retarded and they are not insane, but their range of problems is enormous. Crime, sex, drugs, emotional disturbances, truancy. The main thing that they have in common is that somebody, their family, a judge, a social worker, has sent them away for help, sent them away for the child's own good to places that often call themselves residential treatment facilities, or group homes, or therapeutic communities, or private schools, or boys or girls ranches. Today, there are over 3,000 such facilities, both profit-making and non-profit, and they have custody of an estimated 300,000 American youngsters. The treatment which some of these children undergo is a matter of controversy partly because there are no national standards to determine where therapy ends and mistreatment begins, partly because solid evidence as to which treatments work best is hard to come by. Portions of what you are about to see are raw and emotional, and you may be shocked at what can be done to a youngster for the child's own good. NBC News presents for the child's own good. <laughs> Reported by Robert Rogers. <laughs> Deep in the woods of Maine is one of the most innovative and most profitable adolescent treatment centers. This is Elan. You are watching primal scream therapy which is intended to release a youngster's deepest fears and emotions. But Elan also uses older techniques, like physical punishment for misbehavior and dunce caps for scholastic failure. The kids here are not called patients or inmates, but residents. They come from all over the country. Many have been in other psychiatric institutions before Elan. Their behavior problems range from serious crime to truancy, from sexual promiscuity to drinking and drug taking, from chronic disobedience to running away from home. Some are ordered here by juvenile courts or state agencies, but many are sent by their own parents. Few youngsters volunteer for Elan. 
Some told us they were whisked out of their homes in what they call the Elan Snatch. Some of the kids have mentioned that they or their peers were snatched. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it's usually in the morning, you see, uh, when four residents, um, generally big people, you know, uh, or taller and heavier, uh, will show up at, a, uh, at someone's house and uh, go into a new resident's bedroom and say, Hi, Johnny, we're from Elon and we'd like you to come with us. Like hell, I will. Oh, yes, we've we're been through it, and it's a good thing. And they, and they talk very nicely, but they're big, and they're strong, and they're insistent, and there are four of them. And so it happens. No matter how they arrive, the average resident will spend 17 months here. Whether they like it or not, they become part of a rigid hierarchy. Conformity brings promotion and eventual graduation. Misconduct or failure to adapt enthusiastically to the system brings punishment and public humiliation. Get out there. Come in. You know, I fell for the fact, man. You know that you're taking advantage. You know, because there's no strength in here, okay, to apply any kind of pressure on you. In the jargon of Elan, this is a haircut. Variations of this shouted reprimand echo through every Elan residence. The haircut is a mainstay of the system. The louder, the better. You make sure that everybody else has to be born, too. You don't need to give them a seminar. You don't need to put everyone to sleep. Okay, Even the most minor infraction provokes a torrent of castigation and insults from staff members or from any resident who happens to rank higher in the Elan pecking order. Oh, it's the out there. No one's going to accept that out of you. It's the you better get a grip on it. You know, I gotta ask myself, you know, I ain't gonna produce an acceptance. The theory is that blowing the most trivial incidents out of proportion with angry shouting will lead the supposed offender to take a closer look at himself. Those in charge are convinced you know, that it works. You, feel. you can just lay back in the cut and accept everything that goes around here. Their facility is running. The man who runs Elon is Joe Ritchie. Himself a former delinquent and heroin addict, Richie has strong opinions on why so many families no longer seem able to control their own children. They're acting out. Uh, you know, we've gone through some serious craziness regarding adolescents in the last two decades. We've gone through the free school concept of it's not important that a child has structure. Let them write on the walls. You know, let them do this, let them do that, let them express themselves. Well, that's nonsense. Everybody knows that successful people are people who are disciplined. Even in an expanding business like childcare, Elan's growth has been spectacular. It was founded just nine years ago by Joe Ritchie and Dr. Gerald Davidson, a Boston psychiatrist. They began with just four children. Today, there are over 300 residents. Profits from Elan have helped make Joe Ritchie a millionaire. At Elan, youngsters perform most of the daily chores. Each household is a tightly structured community. New residents do the dirty work under the supervision of more senior residents with titles like ramrod, expediter, and department head. Throughout their stay, residents are switched from job to job and promoted or demoted depending on their conduct and attitude. It is all part of the Elan therapy. They represent our state. At night, words, the residents go to school. Unlike some treatment centers, Elan stresses right? education. House representatives represent there are 27 full-time teachers and an accredited high school, as well as remedial classes for those who need them. All right, the executive branch. Dunce caps are required attire for those who fail courses. In the households, discipline is maintained by an elite group called the expediters. They relay orders, keep track of every resident, and report negative behavior. Some call them spies. Joe Ritchie prefers another name. The expediter is a policeman, very much like the policemen out in society. Uh, they play the same role. They're the line of defense between the normal people and the lunatics. Uh, what, what an expediter does in a house is he makes sure that the game is played honestly. For instance, an expediter's job 
is to make sure that if you're supposed to be in your department and you're functioning, because that's what it calls for, that you're not walking around the halls or you're not hanging out in your room. Even if a youngster manages to elude the expediters and run away, he can look forward to being tracked down and brought back. Joe Ritchie believes that much of Elan's success can be traced to the residents' knowledge that they cannot escape. Adolescents are very shrewd. If you go into a hospital and you don't want to stay there, all you have to do is make an aggressive gesture at a nurse and you're kicked out. Or all you have to do is light your bed on fire and you're kicked out. So consequently, kids learn how to get out of treatment. At Elan, the first thing they learn is you're not going to get out of here. If you burn the place down, we'll sleep in a tent together. Uh, you know, no matter how many times you run away, we will go and get you. Why? Because we have a commitment, all right, to you and to ourselves. You know what? I'm sick and tired of your garbage around here. You know what? I got to deal with your skank. I do not to This, too, is part of the treatment. In so-called encounter groups, residents are encouraged to express their hostile feelings. The result is usually a stream of curses and obscenities. Despite the words, the shouting is so mechanical, so repetitious, that to an outsider, at least, it is not so much shocking as it is monotonous. Play your games with me! I can't feel feminine. I mean, I can't walk around and, and try to be feminine because I, I end up turning it into gamey because of my other feelings. I try to walk around here feminine in high heels and everything I turn After the shouting, anything. there is an attempt to resolve hostilities. Yes, so why don't you ask for help? Why don't you sit down with her and say, Paula... The discussion is led by a staff member. Like most of the therapeutic staff, his main qualification is that he is himself a graduate of Elan. There are no national standards, nor even a consensus of expert opinion on how much formal training should be required of persons involved in treating troubled kids. But both Dr. Davidson, a trained psychiatrist, and Joe Ritchie, who did not graduate from college, believe that experience is the best teacher when it comes to helping the type of kids who come to Elan. What does that mean if you ask for help? What does that mean to you? They might say, no, get away. Or they might, you know, because I know the things I do, and they might do the same thing to me. It costs $17,400 to send the average youngster to Elan for one year. Even at that price, there are judges, social workers, and parents who consider it a bargain. Elan's defenders claim it has the most consistently effective program for salvaging young people who are too difficult for other facilities to handle. So many states want to use Elan that there's a waiting list. But on the other hand, one state agency in Massachusetts will no longer send their youngsters here because they object to the way the children are treated. One reason is the use of physical punishment. Joe, you make no bones about it. There is corporal punishment here at Elan. Tell us about it. What are the stages it comes in? Who's it administered by? Well, it's, it's administered by the kids, first of all. And corporal, it's a, uh, it's a harsh term, okay? What it is, is we have the ring, okay, which uh, everybody misinterprets. It's, it's not a boxing ring, it's a ring of human people. Youngsters who are accused of being bullies are forced to fight continuously against a series of opponents until they are beaten. The bully is introduced as what he is. In this corner is the bully who's trying to turn this facility into a detention center. Okay, and in this corner is the house champion who's going to show him why it can't be done. And that's exactly how it does, and we never allow the bully to win. But uh, girls get put in the ring, too. Well, girls bully as well as boys do. I mean, you know, it doesn't, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're a uh, equal rights facility. Uh, we also use spanking, which is symbolic. Again, it's a last resort, okay? And it's, and it's one resident spanking another resident, and it's done with a ping-pong paddle, okay? And uh, usually a person won't get spanked more than once or twice. But it's a symbolic thing, which is if you're going to act like a baby, you should be treated like a baby. Well, when they spanked me, I mean, they didn't have to spank me, so I turned black and blue. Simple as that. I mean, that was just one time after another. I was so sore I couldn't sit down. Now, to me, that's a little ridiculous. How often were you spanked? Every day for a long time. Hard? Oh, yeah. Clipboards. 
um, hands, <laughs> anything, you know, something that they could, well, I would feel it, supposedly. They thought it would, I needed it because I supposedly was a terribly big baby. How many people spank you? Well, it depends. Usually when they use a paddle, they may have four or five people spank a person like three to five times each. You know, and it doesn't feel too good. So. Do you have any trouble sitting down the rest of the week? Oh, yeah. I have had trouble doing that for a Well, what I was saying was that we're upfront about it, the boxing ring, the spanking, that we're into containment, controlling, and justice. We're not into degradation. Uh, the idea is not to punish, all right? The idea is to make sure we have an orderly society, a society where people don't get abused. In my early days at Elan, I uh, split. I left the program and I went to Boston. I stayed in Boston approximately two days and I returned to the program where I uh, encountered a semi-professional boxer in what they call the boxing ring. Um, it was more than just the boxing ring. It was uh, sort of, you could say, a kill situation where I stood no chance even in defending myself. And uh, it was too much. It was definitely too much. You were badly beaten? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why is it so much fun for you to be miserable? And what do you get out of it? In the Elan system of relentless emotional pressure, the ultimate tool is the general meeting. Prompted by staff members, the entire household confronts a single resident. The purpose is to force her to reveal her deepest feelings about herself. You just better start being honest with us, man, because everyone here is getting pretty hostile. I, just, I get hostile because I look at you as an ingrate, right? I look at you as a brat, I look at you as a spoiled brat. You have nothing in, you know, inside you, just a selfish little spoiled leech is what you are. If you think people you know, are going to, you know, you know, give you and get you in this, you're, you're out of your mind, you know what I mean? You just the girl is 16 from the Middle West. Her parents sent her here after she had run away from home and got in trouble with the law. That's why everyone's reacting to you. You're disgusting in a way, man. Because everyone here is trying to be the exact opposite of what you are now, and you want to hold on to it. That's the disgusting part of it. You just think that you, you are it, okay? And as long as the girl resists making the admissions which the staff wants to hear, the angry mood intensifies. Okay, and what I want to ask myself is why do they have to sit down and why do they have to go through it and why do they have to be honest and you don't have to? Answer me that one. Why do they have to do it and you don't? I should do it, but I don't. Nice. Why don't you think you have to? I can be honest with you, I just don't tell the whole thing. I just what? Don't tell the whole thing. Be not honest. Not honest. You haven't been honest since the day you walked in the door. You have to say something right now. You, you better start being honest around here. You have to know me around here. You have to fight. Finally, the meeting erupts yeah, into a yeah, tirade yeah. of foul language. Yeah, yeah, Residents yeah. take turns verbally bludgeoning the girl with obscene insults and threats until she is reduced to tears and submission. You little selfish little ingrate chill. You know, I feel like you come up there whipping your face off. You don't think I'm going to sit back here. You know, everybody's going to feel sorry for you. Well, the world don't, you know, revolve around you. Everybody went around and 99 and 9 tenths percent of the people in this room told you in so many words they think you suck as a person. That you give nothing and that if they had their way, they'd cut your throat put you out of your misery and relieve the human race of having to deal with an ingrate like you. And then you stand up there as if nobody said it, as if they believe everything you're trying to run on. What kind of response do you expect to get? You're dishonest, you're lying, you're playing your games. If you want to change so bad, why is it that you don't tell the truth? What do you feel that, that you've done that's, that makes you such a bad I person? I hate myself first because I, like when I was, like when I was out there, I, uh, I just, I tell my mother I hate her 24 hours a day. I, I, she was a bitch and I hated her so much because she didn't give me what I wanted. To, she didn't give me what I wanted, and I just, I can remember telling her to say I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, and, and I'm just, yeah, what else? And, 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 and I know you don't want to address yourself to it. I was saying that, well, what else is going to hurt you? You make yourself feel like it's such a dirt. 
Hey, Poison. Well, what about that? Hmm? I hate myself. <laughs> Just because I had to... That's not what you told me. Before, what, what's so hard to, 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 to get it up right now, Seth? Why can't you put your car? I don't. I don't like to think about it. And when well, I think, think about, about it, okay? Because they don't like to think about things either. But they have to. And what is it? Look at myself as a dirty, sleazy, scummy person that used to live on the streets. <laughs> Even though I didn't come from the streets, right? I just I picture myself doing it, you know, just going out the streets and just going to bed with every guy I know. Hey, why do you keep passing over? It's not what you told me. It's not what you told other people. You know, be real. I hate myself for it. I hate myself for going through that. I'm having a. What does it make you feel like? Like I'm not even a. Exist. I just come right off the, off the street that I hate it. And I just hate myself so much. What because does, of What does an abortion mean to you? What does it mean? I killed something. It was a part of me that I wanted. This, I wanted so much, but I wanted like someone to love and someone to love me back. And I just flushed it right down the toilet. That so makes me feel like so dirty, like, disgusting. NBC News queried a number of mental health experts about the effectiveness and safety of this type of confrontation. Most replied that it all depends on a variety of factors. One has to be extremely careful in using confrontation. You can only use confrontation when there is also support, when there is also follow through, when there is also some kind of alternative that the youth can uh, learn positively, positive ways of dealing with situations. Negative things in which the person is just destroyed as a human being, humiliated, devastated, ruined, and thrown into a, a terribly, terribly destructive state can lead in some cases to psychosis. The only reason that we can make the kinds of demands we do and put the kinds of pressure on young people is because we give them an equivalent amount of support. And so if you, if you spend time here, at first all you hear is the loud noise and the demands and so on and so forth. But if you spend time and you watch, you begin to see the tenderness and the support and the caring and the organized caring that goes on in this place. The last four days, we've seen you go through some pretty rough stuff. Many changes. Well, do you think this meeting we saw today, all these kids calling you names and putting you down, do you think that's helped you? Yeah. And it, yes, it has, because I need, I need it. I need to hear what, how people look at me so I can change. Because I know they, they may look at me a, a certain way, or a slut, or a sleaze, or a dirt bag, or whatever. And I need to hear it because I, it makes me want to change. It makes me not like it. I don't like hearing it at all. And as much as I hate it, it's good for me just so I could change it and, and feel good about myself, because right at this point, I hate myself. This young man, named Steve, spent 18 months at Elan. Two years after leaving there, he is a full-time college student. He earns spending money playing with a rock group and has become a dedicated athlete. Elan likes to call itself a last resort facility for troubled kids who have not been helped by other, more traditional methods. It claims that two-thirds of all its former residents are now leading productive lives. That figure has not been scientifically verified. But Steve considers himself an Elan success. I like to think of myself as being a successful graduate, yeah. What about other graduates that you know? I can only judge it against mine, and I think they're doing well, some better, some not so good. But they're all doing as best they can, and a heck of a lot better than before. I look back at Elan and I figure, uh, where, where was I? No, really, where was I? Where, what were these people doing to me? They were saying they were helping me, but uh, now that I'm back home, I'm not sure where I am. Compared to the other Elan graduates that you know personally, 
Are you doing better or are you doing worse than the average? I'm doing worse than the average, yes. Um, In what ways? I don't have a job. I'm supported by my parents. What's life like now? I've never been happier. I haven't been happier in my uh, 19 years. You still doing drugs? Occasionally, I smoke pot once in a while and some other things, but uh, not as much anymore as I ever did. But it's not running your life? Oh, no, not at all. My work is running my life. I enjoy my work so much now. I used to hate to work before. I actually like it, and to me, that's surprising. But you still think that you might be dead today, or at least be a, an addict and maybe a hooker if, if you hadn't gone to a line. I believe that, yeah, it could be true. That is a very big possibility. Also, I could have turned the whole tables around myself, like I was saying. One or the other, and I don't want to go back five years and find out.